Is the U.S. Constitution based on the Bible? Many famous conservative Christians say it is. Radio and TV host Glenn Beck says, quote, the founders used the Bible as the compass to enact the laws of the Constitution. Christian activist David Barton said, I can show you clause after clause in the Constitution where they use the exact language of the Bible in the Constitution. On the other hand, President John Adams signed and President Thomas Jefferson supported the Treaty of Tripoli. This treaty said, quote, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. This treaty was unanimously approved by the United States Senate in 1797. This means that all 32 senators agreed with it only 10 years after the Constitution was written, when most of the writers of the Constitution were still living and were available to answer questions about what they meant when they wrote it. The Treaty of Tripoli was law. It governed the relationship between the United States and the nation of Tripoli, which is now Libya, in the Ottoman Empire. Who is right? Let's take a look at the Constitution itself. Let's start with the very first words of each document. Genesis says in the beginning of God. Matthew says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Mark says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But the Constitution starts in the preamble with we the people. In fact, God and Jesus, by their various names, are mentioned well over 10,000 times in the Bible. But the body of the Constitution never mentions them a single time, unless you count the date at the end, which is non-theological and simply trivial. And the Constitution does not mention the Bible or Christianity at all, not one time. Let's take a brief look at the whole preamble. The preamble tells us the reasons why our founders wrote the Constitution. Those reasons are union, justice, domestic tranquility, and so forth. Notice what is missing, any mention of any religion or any God. This again is very much in contrast to the Bible, in which God is the central figure and which was written so that people could believe in the Judeo-Christian God and do what God wants them to do. Let's move on to Article 1, Legislative Powers. Article 1 is very clear that legislative powers are vested in a House and Senate, which are elected by the people. I'd like to find some Bible passages to compare to Article 1, but there aren't any. Any mention of any legislative body or any elected government whatsoever is completely missing from the Bible, which says very clearly that God chooses the leaders of government. You may wonder why God chose people like Hitler, Stalin, Bashar al-Assad, Nero, and Caligula. That's a very good question, but it will have to wait for another video. God's perfectly inspired word clearly says that he always picks the governing powers, so we're going to have to leave it at that. The rest of Article Run describes the details of the House and Senate. You can read it for yourself and see that it is as godless and non-biblical as section 1. But when we get to section 9, we find our first parallel between the Bible and the Constitution. Slavery. The U.S. Constitution originally allowed slavery and in this section actually permitted imported slaves to be taxed at $10 per person. The Bible mentions slavery over 700 times. But not once does it say that slavery is wrong. Slavery was outlawed in the United States in 1865 by the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. There is no such amendment to the Bible. Section 9 goes on to protect rights of habeas corpus, prohibits bills of attainder, ex post facto laws, and titles of nobility. The Bible does not guarantee these rights and explicitly says that God will choose a king. Let's move on to Article 2 of the Constitution, which describes the President and his powers. As with the Senators and Representatives, the President is elected, not chosen by God, and serves for only a term of four years unless he is elected again. This is very different from the Bible, which says God chooses a king who served for life. 
You can read Article 2 yourself. It is just as godless as Article 1. But there is one more thing about Article 2 which is very interesting. The oath that the President has to take. Notice that the oath does not mention any God. Most Presidents do add something like, so help me God. I mean, after all, they are politicians. But that is not part of the President's oath of office, and they don't have to. Notice also that there is no requirement for the President to swear on a Bible. Four Presidents actually did not swear on a Bible. Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Pierce, John Quincy Adams, and Lyndon Johnson. Now, let's move on to Article 3. Article 3 describes the court system. Note that federal courts are independent of the executive and legislative branches of the federal government. There is no court system or judiciary in the Bible. Kings, such as Solomon, decided matters which are decided in the courts in the United States. In the Bible, the king's power was unlimited. But in the Constitution, the powers of all branches of government are limited. Solomon could even order that an innocent baby be cut in half. There were people who were called judges in the Old Testament before the Hebrews had a king. But they were not judges in the same way that the U.S. Constitution defines judges. Old Testament judges were military and tribal leaders. As it says in Judges 2.16, the Lord would choose special leaders known as judges. These judges would lead the Israelites into battle and defeat the enemies that made raids on them. Another thing that Article 3 does is to guarantee the right to trial by jury. There is no hint of the idea of trial by jury in the Bible. Let's move on to Article 4. Article 4 deals mainly with the various relationships between individual states, so I won't discuss it here. But there are two parts of Article 4 which are relevant to our question about the Bible and the Constitution. First, every state is guaranteed to have a Republican form of government, that is, an elected representative government. As we have already seen, that is nowhere in the Bible. But we do find another parallel between the Bible and the Constitution in Article 4, Section 2, which attempts to regulate slavery. It requires that escaped slaves be returned to their owner, even if they escape to a state where slavery is illegal. There are many parallels to this in the Bible, but the parallels to the stories of Hagar and Onesimus are particularly striking. Now on to Article 5. This part of the Constitution describes provisions for amending the Constitution. Very clearly, amending the Constitution is a human endeavor, without any mention of any help from God, or any religion, or any religious book. Once again, the Constitution very clearly did not rely on the Bible for any of Article 5. Article 6 says that the Constitution, not the Bible, is the law. But this article contains one more clause which is very interesting because it was very controversial way back in 1787 when the states were deciding whether to ratify the Constitution, specifically because it contradicts the Bible and contradicts over a thousand years of Christian doctrine. Paragraph 3 of Article 6 says, quote, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. This was very controversial specifically because it contradicted Christian beliefs and even contradicted the constitutions of many of the states, which did require that elected officials and government employees be Christians. Now on to Article 7. The article discusses ratification, as with the rest of the Constitution, it is the people who decide, not God. There is not even a suggestion that the people ask God for help, although it also does not discourage them from doing so. Notice also that this article also contains a sentence that is as close as the Constitution ever comes to actually mentioning God or Christ. Quote, the year of our Lord. This is obviously trivial and certainly not a theological reference. Some Christians make a big deal of it, but they are grasping at straws. There is one other parallel between the Bible and the Constitution. It is explicitly stated in the Bible many times, but only not prohibited by the Constitution. That is, requiring an inferior, submissive role for women. This is a common theme in the Bible and in many modern Christian churches. 
but we changed the Constitution by adding the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and by adding the 19th Amendment, which guaranteed women the right to vote. So now the Constitution no longer permits laws that require women to be treated inferior to men. There are currently 27 amendments to the Constitution. You can read them yourself. They are just as godless as the original Constitution. I don't want to discuss them on the, in this video, but I want to briefly mention the first 10, which are called the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights guarantees such things as religious freedom, the right to trial by jury, right to peaceably assemble, prohibitions on unreasonable searches, protection against self-incrimination, prohibition against excessive bail and double punishment for the same crime, and the government's obligation to provide an attorney if the accused cannot afford one. The Bible does not guarantee any of these rights. In fact, the Bible specifically excludes some rights that are guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. According to the Bible, exercising religious freedom is heresy or idolatry. Exercising freedom of speech or freedom of the press excludes blasphemy. The Bill of Rights prohibits double punishment and cruel and unusual punishment. But God dispenses infinite eternal punishment in hell in a burning lake of fire to everyone who does not have faith in him. So is the U.S. Constitution based on the Bible? We have seen that President Adams, Vice President Jefferson, and the entire United States Senate passed a law that said that the United States was not founded on Christianity only 10 years after the Constitution was written. We've seen that the Constitution never mentions God, Christ, the Bible, or Christianity a single time, except a trivial date reference at the end. The central figure of the Constitution is we, the people, not God. We have seen the Constitution requires elected government, a concept totally missing from the Bible. The Constitution requires a separate, elected, legislative branch, which we call Congress, but there is no form of legislative government in the Bible. The President's oath of office, which is specified in the Constitution, is not religious. The Constitution requires an independent judiciary, which is not in the Bible. The Constitution limits the power of government, but kings in the Bible had unlimited power. The Constitution requires there be no religious test for a government job. We have seen that the gov Constitution guarantees certain rights, such as trial by jury, freedom of speech, and the press, no double punishment, religious freedom, peaceable assembly, reasonable searches, no self-incrimination, no excessive bail, and attorney provided, which are not guaranteed and in some cases are even contradicted by the Bible. But we have also seen that the Constitution does have two clear parallels with the Bible. Both allow and attempt to regulate slavery, and the Constitution permits laws requiring an inferior, submissive role for women. Both of these, however, have been repealed by amending the Constitution. So, is the U.S. Constitution based on the Bible? We hope we have given you enough information to make a well-informed decision. Thank you for watching our video. For more interesting information about Christianity, please visit our website, freethinkersbooks.com. If you liked our video, please click the YouTube like icon, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share our video with your friends. Thanks again.